Uh, thank you very much for this extraordinary opportunity to be in Melbourne today, to the organizers of the meetings. We proudly acknowledge Victoria's First Nations people and their ongoing strength in practicing the world's oldest living culture. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and waters on which Global Table is being celebrated and pay our deepest respect to their elders, past and present. It's an interesting moment in history. It's an interesting moment in time uh, to hear an extraordinary presentation by someone as erudite as John Kerry yesterday talking and talking about governments and talking about what has to happen. Well, there's another whole world that goes on simultaneously to that, and that is the world of science and application. And what do we have to do to make these things move forward? Let's start with the premise that the speed of change is faster than our response. And when we think about the time it takes to actually make a change, an agricultural change, an agroforestry change, an agroecosystem change, think about 30 years. And if I think about 30 years, and let's call it 2020, that's 2050, I'm not sure we have that much time anymore. I'm not sure we have the ability to hold off and expect it 30 years in this acceptable amount of time. So is it 15 years or is it 10 years? The question is, do we have the will and do we have the methodologies? And when we think about humans and nature, there's sort of five categories that most anthropologists and archeologists take us through. There's the first and obvious place where we live with nature. And that's hunter-gatherer. And most of us would not survive very well in the hunter-gatherer uh, society. Then we tame it, early cultivation, which has gone on around the world. Most of us wouldn't do very well in that. And then we conquer it. And things like the burning of the Amazon right now and how we have displaced uh, trees and forests and changed the entire ecosystem as a regions of the world to produce food may not be the best way through the mitigation and clearance. And then we exploit it. And land has been exploited at a very high rate. And the famous phrase is, they're making more people every day, but we're not making any more dirt, is appropriate at this time because we use so much land for agriculture and we're not even close to really feeding the planet. Even though, as John Kerry mentioned yesterday, if we got rid of the waste of the system, we might have a chance. And then we change it through genetic engineering, synthetic biology, and technologies like CRISPR. But to focus for one moment on what John Kerry said yesterday about waste, think about the number 1.5 quadrillion. 1.5 quadrillion kilocalories are lost in the food that is wasted every year. 1.5 quadrillion. Four, 45 trillion gallons of water are embedded in that loss. It's unconscionable to waste that much of anything. So food production is the biggest threat to our planet. 70% of the biodiversity loss, 70% of the fresh water use, 25% of the greenhouse gas emissions come directly from that. 85% of the marine stocks are exploited. The most chemical use, the most chemical use. And we've lost 50% of our topsoil. People say it takes 200 years to make an inch of topsoil. So 2050 doesn't really make any difference in a 200 year perspective. This is a chart that my friend Jason Clay gave to me. When we start to think about what has happened from 20, uh, 2004 to 2013, from an article by Jerry uh, Nelson, when you look at these spikes, try to think about what happened in parts of the world. When you see Egypt, what was the Egypt spring about? The Arab Spring. It was the price of bread, right? Where did the wheat for the bread come from? Came from the Ukraine. What happened in the Ukraine that year? There was a failure of the crop. One of the bread baskets of the world failed. 
So the trickle-down effect is not slow, it's immediate. Very few of us have really a clear understanding, myself as well, the complexities of trying to have a robust food system that's ubiquitous across the planet, and what do you do when you have something like the failure of the Ukraine? So the global food problem is not what most of us think about. We talk about calories, we talk about food, we rarely talk about the word nutrition. So I would like for you to take the word calorie and put it aside and think about nutrition security and then add a word safe. So it is not food if it is not nutritious and it is not safe. And I'll talk about some of the issues that impact that like a little carcinogen called aflatoxin later in my speech. No single actor or publication, no matter how profound, will make the global food system more sustainable. Remember that. There's not a single thing that will make it more sustainable. There are very few Einsteins anymore working by themselves, making great discoveries which impact the world. We have no idea yet how to feed the planet without frying it. And these are not alarmist mentalities that are writing this. This is the Washington Post editorial board. And most of what I'll refer to today was written since January 1st. So I'm not even going back years and decades. I'm only talking about the last nine months. The comments that are being made are not old, they're fresh. They happened yesterday or they happened the day before. When the Washington Post editorial board says, we have no idea yet how to feed the planet, and we have the Millennium Development Goals, or the Sustainable Development Goals, excuse me, and 11 of the 17 have to do with agriculture. And they say this, what is the action plan we have? Again, the speed of change is faster than our response. In the old days, this is what a highly regarded maize breeder looked like. All of his corn looked the same. 1931, the winner of the Iowa State Fair for the best corn. But think about where corn came from, if you will. How many of you know the plant Teosinte? Raise your hand. About eight. <laughs> if you look at the plant, Think about this. The seed is on the outside, not the inside. The seed is growing on the outside. And then some witty person, somewhere between seven and 10,000 years ago, decided he would work on that plant and he came to a Teosinte corn hybrid in the middle, but that wasn't really sufficient. And then someone at some point bred modern corn, which you're all familiar with where the seed is on the inside. Imagine the shock that somebody would have starting with teosinte, seed on the outside, and breeding modern corn, seed on the inside. How dramatic that is. How explosive an idea that is. That only took seven to 10,000 years. <laughs> I have a lot of heroines and a lot of heroes in my life, and they're relevant to this conversation because it has to do with what it takes to solve a problem. There are World Food Prize winners in this group and there are Nobel laureates in this group. Most of you who took high school biology and a few of you who took it in college, remember jumping genes, transposons? It meant that something could move in a gene. It doesn't seem like a very wild idea today, but when Barbara McClintock came up with this idea, it was revolutionary. And what were her tools? Imagine this toolkit. Five years of corn and a single microscope. And for that, she won the Nobel Prize in Medicine. And I love her thought. I never thought of stopping. I just hated sleeping. I can't imagine having a better life than being a scientist. IR64. How many of you can recognize IR64? 
two. IR64 is this. This is what IR64 is. This is what it takes to breed the most popular rice in the world. This is all generations of crosses. This is the work starting with a series of parents over here and over here, male and female crossing the pollen, new cultivar crossing that, back crossing it, crossing it again, crossing it again. And this is Gerd of Cush, who was my office mate at Davis for many, many years. Agriculture scientists and geneticists need to work overtime to meet the ever-growing human need for food and alleviate hunger and poverty. That's all it took, one guy sitting with plants. But the slide before was what the actual fact was, the Green Revolution. I know it's a very complicated topic for many of you. I hear about it every time I praise it. Imagine you did a problem solve in 19, late 1960s, let's say. Would you imagine that that one solution would be the solution all the way to 2019? Do you go to see a dentist who practices 1968 methodologies? What happened to all the scientists that have lived since Norman Borlaug and M.S. Swaminathan created the Green Revolution with dwarf rice? And I point out the last part of this quote from Swaminathan and Borlaug. It has an entirely different meaning to most people in the affluent nations of the privileged world than to those in the developing nations of the forgotten world. So criticize all this you want, the Green Revolution. It kept essentially 200 to 300 million people from starvation in Pakistan and India, the last time they probably collaborated. And this is M.S. Swaminathan and Norman Borlaug. Almost certainly, however, the first essential component of social justice is adequate, adequate food for all mankind. The sequencer, it's a little tool we use all the time now. It gives you information. It allows you to understand what things are made of, what the genetic makeup is. It's a road map. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there, which was what all the old time breeding used to be. But with the sequencer, we got a first idea of a road map. And this is Frederick Sanger, who won the Nobel Prize twice. Very few people have done that. And this was the beginning of the sequencer as we know it today. And then came Oxford Nanopore after many, many years. And imagine you plug into your cell phone a sequencer and you can actually sequence something. Or you put it into your USB port of your computer, you can get a full long read sequence out of these little simple machines. And then came this institution called BGI. Yellow, red, yellow, green, and blue. Those are the colors for AC, G, and T. Imagine making your headquarters in the world the four letters of the genomes, A, C, G, and T. And then they developed this little piece of kit. This is called the MySeq T7. MySeq T7. It has one unique feature. You can reuse the reagents, which are the expensive part of this process. The first human genome cost about a trillion dollars. This machine does 60 human genomes in a day. It took three years to do it as well. This speed of change is faster than our ability to almost use it. Hunger and malnutrition. John Kerry mentioned yesterday in the comments that he was delivering to you specifically about waste. How can we have hungry people in the world? How is that even humanly possible to have hungry people in the world? And not just hungry, chronically hungered and malnutrition. Some statistics for you. 37% of the children under five in the rural sector of Africa are stunted. And what is stunting? We usually refer to it as weight and height for an age. Two other parts to stunting. 
One is neurological development. Without the appropriate folates, the neural tube and a young girl who's pregnant, a young woman who's pregnant, will not develop. And then the third part of it is economic. They will not be a Bill Gates. They will not be anyone who is going to make a lot of money or even be able to afford to take care of themselves or their families. And they will die young because they get sick more often. The impact on some parts of Africa is 14% of the GDP from this. 48%, even a bigger number, 48% of the rural children under five in India are stunted. I should also say it's irreversible. Stunting, you can't pull it back with supplementation or anything of that nature. You can't change it once it's happened. And in the United States, we had an interesting program called A Thousand Days. The first three years of a child's more or less. It should have been 1,600 or 1,800 days. Pre-pregnancy, if you don't have all the nutrients, the minerals, the vitamins in your body, and you become pregnant, and you don't have them again in pregnancy, what happens? The child is stunted. Stunting. It's inconceivable that it could go on. 7%. That's the United States. 7% of the population in the United States is stunted. One of the richest nations on earth. Everything's available. Go to Walmart, you can buy all the food you want. Go to Costco, it's all available. And yet 7% of the population in the United States under five is stunted. So these numbers really cause me to stop in my tracks and say, what have I done for my whole career? You know, I've released the cacao genome, and I initiated the peanut genome, and I've been in maybe 200, 300 varieties of plants into the public domain, worked in Africa, worked in Asia, worked in South America, worked in Latin America. And then all of a sudden I understand this. I'm an old guy. And you, you wake up from a lecture you hear from a young professor and you want to challenge them on the veracity of the information. Is it possibly true what you've just said? And lo and behold, it's probably worse than she reported. One in every five people is hungry in Africa. 30% under five are suffering from stunting. This is very conservative from the FAO. Wasting. 13 point million children are wasting. 9.7 million children under five are overweight, which is another aspect of wasting or hunger. When you look at these statistics, then you add anemia. It's frightening. How do we, how do we really make a change that lifts everybody out, lifts everybody at the same time? So this gives you an idea of where it happens. East Africa, above 40%. West Africa, largely above that. And you see it, it's just, it should make you want to scream, really. So I went home from this lecture and paced the floor for hours on end, thinking, what could you do? Well, you could make vegetables like carrots much more nutritious because they're only basically nutritious. Vitamin A, normal vision at night like you and I, and that's night blindness, and this is what it looks like. When you consider what a person sees at night, that's how they see if they have night blindness. Imagine you're stricken with that. Simple greens, simple greens, not even complex plants. Hemoglobin, we all know what hemoglobin is. Vitality of the blood cells. And look what happens when that changes to anemic because you don't have that in your diet or you have so little of it in the plants that you eat that it doesn't really work to improve your health.
iodine. We take it for granted because we have salt that's improved with it and we have it in our diet. But if you don't have it, it causes cretinism. Simple things like broccoli. When you consider how simple this crop is, it has so many folates in it that if you don't get the right amount of folates, your neural tubes will never develop. It's a tragedy. And it turns out that most of the food we eat has not been improved for nutrition. I once was at the State Department at a meeting with John Kerry, and I asked the CEO of a big company called Monsanto and one called Pioneer if they would share with me publicly all the data on all the crops they've worked on on nutrition. And of course, they didn't answer me. I had the podium. They didn't. But at lunch, I sat with them, and they whispered, we have never worked on nutrition, essentially. So here are two of the biggest seed companies in the world saying to me, we've never worked on nutrition. And I was thinking, we really got to fix Africa. One more crop that seems so simple. The world's largest producer of cashews is Cote d'Ivoire in West Africa. It's zinc. It helps against stunted growth. Never been improved. So what do you do? Well, let's breed plants that are more nutritious, that are higher yielding, resilient to climate change, resistance to pest and disease, and water and nutrient use efficient. Water and nutrient use efficiency means if you only have a little bit of nutrients in the soil, which is most places, then this will utilize that as well as possible. Water nutrient, uh, water use efficiency means that if the weather is aberrant patterns, what will happen is we'll pick up as much water as possible, we'll reduce the need of water for that plant, possibly up to 65%. And then we'll have a robust plant that's full of nutrition. Well, how do you do that? And how do you say, okay, I'm going to fix broccoli for Africa, or I'm going to fix some other crop for Africa, and who am I to choose what should be chosen? So I formed this little thing called the African Orphan Crops Consortium. In my mind, it was very modest. And the African Plant Breeding Academy. And this is Ibrahim Mayaki who is the CEO of NEPAD, which is the development arm of the African Union, malnutrition can have a devastating effect on populations. This is the guy who is one of the most important people about development in Africa. This is what he said. So what did we do? OK. We sat with Abraham, had this long meeting. I will personally work on 12 crops. I will fix 12 crops. I went to see my friend Tony Simons at ICRAF, the World Agroforestry Center. The African Orphan Crops Consortium gives Africa a chance through new science and its application to address many of its perennial problems of development. That's what we were going to do. But I didn't have any money. So we decided we'd do a survey of African food scientists, nutritionists, women's groups, farmers, on and on and on. We sent out 100 surveys, got 106 surveys back. So those of you who do surveys know that you want to get about 30% so you can feel good about yourself. We got 106% back. It was the most complicated survey I've ever seen because we asked so much information of the participants. Some people sent back, your list should include these 283 food crops. And I was going to work on six or 12. <laughs> so we scaled it all, and we came up with 100 food crops, which were the backbone of Africa. Not East Africa, not West Africa, not Central Africa, the backbone of Africa. Now I had a list but I didn't have really any way to fix it. So on Thanksgiving a few years ago, I went to Shenzhen, China, and met with BGI, the gigantic sequencing group, and met with the founder 
And I said to him, I need your help. I want to do 12 crops. This is the most I could do in my lifetime. It's, it's, a, it's audacious anyway. He says, it's not enough. It won't make enough difference. It's Africa. Okay, I'll do 24. He looked at me and said, Howard, it's not enough. 24 crops will not fix the problem you're trying to fix. Okay, I'll do 48. <laughs> and he looked at me deadpan serious, and he said, it's not enough. You got a list of 100. Why wouldn't you do 100? So the cocoa genome took me two years and 10 days. So with 100 crops, it would be 200 years. <laughs> and even eating as healthy as I eat, it probably wasn't possible. That's where the word consortium comes into play. And I said, but I don't have any money. He said, we'll do the reference genomes. Remember the roadmap? The roadmap is the reference genome. But then you have to resequence everything hundreds of times to fill in the encyclopedia. This plant grows in salty soil. This plant grows with lots of water. This grows short. This grows tall. This has lots of nutrition. You have to look at hundreds of plants. So then I need a laboratory. So this is kind of the way the plants line up. I know for most of you this doesn't mean anything, but this sort of shows the families of all the plants. It's important for me because when I talk to people, I can talk about the vast variety. None of these plants on that list have ever been worked on for nutrition. This is what everyone eats in the morning for breakfast. They make their porridge for their children. They have it for lunch. They have it for dinner. This is what young women eat before they're pregnant. But it hasn't been improved. That's why it's called an orphan crop. So we said, we're going to improve them all. This is what it took to start the project. The first sequencers I had for my reference laboratory were made by Life Technology, now Thermo Fisher. 24 months later, they were archaic. So then I got an Illumina HiSeq 4000, which most universities in Australia use as a standard. 18 months later, it's archaic. Now I use Oxford Nanopore. My point is, without this kind of group of people to, to put this together, it could not happen. It would not happen. Where do you store all the data? We're already at five petabytes. Oh, you go to a little company down the road from myself. I live in Davis, California. I went to Google and said, I've got this really big problem. And uh, you should just give me all the data storage I want for free as a public service. <laughs> and they said yes. <laughs> I mean, you don't know till you ask. Is that not correct? And why wouldn't you act audacious? And then you say to yourself, okay, I've got all this data. Who's going to utilize it? I can't breed 101. Oh, that's the other point. I went to the African Union presented my program. I felt pretty cool about it. 100 plants. We'll get it done in my lifetime. And I forget which gentleman it was from one of the African countries in the President's Council said, you forgot a plant. <laughs> and honestly, I was perplexed because I didn't think I forgot anything. He said, you forgot Baobab. He said, when I grew up as a child, and the droughts came, and we had no fresh food, we had the pods of the baobab tree. And we would eat them and the leaves, and it would get us through. OK, 101 crops. <laughs> Who will use this information? I don't have enough friends to make sure the information would be used. So then we started a plant breeding academy. And very quickly, we realized even if we had an academy, people couldn't pay to attend the academy. So I went out and found a few private individuals, and we funded it, sent out a notification. For the first class, we got 65 applicants. We filled 35 spots, 21 accepted. 
We pay everything. Cab fare, airfare, visas, housing, food. We pay everything. They come to Nairobi three times a year for two weeks at a time. They're taught by the best teachers in the world, the very best teachers, the people who wrote the books, who have full professorships at their institutions, the very best people in the world. The last class, class four, which will graduate on December 13th, we had over 800 applicants for 35 spots. Class five, we're getting ready to advertise. We're sure we'll have over 1,000. And class six, which is being planned, will have the same. The demand is so great. We've graduated 115 people from the African Plant Breeding Academy. They have 283 programs on research going simultaneously right now. And they've raised over 18 million euros from the European Union to do the work. But it's a weird group. This is uncommon collaboration. And fortunately, The Economist wrote an article about it. So it helps when you go to see someone when you can say that Jeff Carr at The Economist wrote this article. Gene editing. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I want you to know that this is something that will make the issue of the speed, the speed of change is faster in our response. You've heard of these things called like zinc fingers, talons, crispers, erasers, and pencils. These are words and terms that make almost no difference to you. But the alpha zero paradox is why you have to understand this. And the alpha zero paradox is something that is recent in time. And what the alpha zero paradox proved was that artificial intelligence is no longer constrained by the limits of human knowledge. And what this alpha zero paradox did This group of people taught a, a computer the rules of chess, nothing else. Not all the moves that have ever been made like Deep Blue had in the IBM program. All the other chess programs have deep, 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 every move, the Fisher opening, the Kasparov defense. They didn't teach it anything. They just taught it the rules. And in 24 hours, it beat everybody in the world. All the computer programs and all the superstars of chess and Go and the Japanese version of chess. All it did was to teach it the rules. And what is the line in here? It, it did so by playing like neither a grandmaster nor a pre-existing program. This is what we have to do right now. Otherwise, everything is lost. So I have a few heroines and heroes in this category. I work with Jennifer Doudna. I know George, I know Zhang. I have not yet to meet Carpentier. But these are the people who are involved with the discovery of CRISPR. And collectively, even though the University of California, Berkeley, and MIT, Harvard, through the Broad Institute are at war with each other, they will all share the Nobel Prize one day. So this is kind of what it looks like. You have some guard RNAi, you have a Cas9 enzyme, you target the DNA, you cut it, and then you put it back together again. No genetic modification, no genetic engineering, no foreign DNA. And this is what it looks like in real life under a microscope. You can see all the pieces. And then you add some uh, guide RNA where you're going to make the cut, then you make the cut. And recently, August 14th, remember I was telling you I, I don't talk about anything longer than a year old because it's archaic? They modified 20 sites in a gene. It's, it's so profound that we'll be able to breed better and faster plants. The question and the most important answer is, if consumers believe that hidden information about a food is being held back from them, they may question it. So Greg Jaffe, who's a, a buddy, has written extensively on this. Everyone should understand this. And it's a democratized technology. And then I was faced with a thing called aflatoxin. I thought my life was pretty good. 
got the African orphan crops going. We'll have 190 or 200 people graduated in five years. We'll have 400 breeding programs going on. They'll be hitting the fields very shortly. I see, not in my lifetime, but in many of yours' lifetime, the eradication of chronic hunger and malnutrition in Africa. It could happen other places as well. Then someone said, oh, aflatoxin. What are you do about aflatoxin? Well, it only impacts 4.5 billion people a year. So I was pretty happy with my little project in Africa, affecting the population of about 1.3 billion in 2050. Now someone said, well, you put these groups together to think this way, why don't you take on aflatoxin? So we're doing it in the plant, but I want to talk to you about storage because clean materials brought to warehouses and when it's brought to the warehouse, because the warehousing is not like you see in Melbourne or San Francisco, it becomes toxified with its class one carcinogen. So I decided I'd put a puzzle together and I put it online with a group called Fold It. And we would have citizen science, much like the Alpha Zero Paradox, People who do not know the rules, do not know you can't fold proteins, create new enzymes, and we will detoxify aflatoxin and storage. Usually we get laughter in the audience <laughs> because it's scientists. They say it won't happen. The best players of fold it in the world are not scientists. They're retired people, stay-at-home moms and dads, truck drivers. It's a game. It's not like you play these games that many of the youngsters at your homes today play, except it's war. This is folding proteins. You have a problem. You play fold it. You take it into synthetic biology. And bingo, we launched it in 2017 on World Food Day. And this is important because it's great for an individual like myself and a couple colleagues to come up with something to do. What's really important is having the endorsement of the World Food Program or WHO or FAO because that gives it credibility because many people think this is not credible. It's only played by 500,000 people. Again, the alpha zero paradox. Give them the rules, but don't tell them how to do it. The problem, the solution, and the methodology. So this is what we do. We take the aflatoxin, we detoxify it, we hydrolyze it. That's the premise. This is what it looks like. You can go online and play this game. Go home tonight and play this game. You change the structure of the proteins. You get scored. There are many ways to be scored. And then we take all of these. This is what you see on the screen, by the way. And don't be afraid of it. Just go and play. And this in common collaboration has received 1.6 million puzzle solutions. Citizen science. The entire scientific world has never come up with 1.6 potential solutions to detoxify aflatoxin in storage. And in closing, you can't wake a person who's pretending to sleep. And the reason I say that, regulators, government officials, academics, senior professors, myself included, if you don't start to think like the alpha zero paradox, if you don't start to really think about why can't that be done? And why wouldn't I put people together to do it? What John Kerry talked about yesterday was an observation and how he's trying to fix it. I'm talking about the same thing. Aflatoxin is a class one carcinogen. 20 parts per billion will not pass muster in the United States or Australia to be eaten. 20 parts per billion 
is 20 seconds in 32 years. That's what it takes Usain Bolt to run the 200 meters. One time in 32 years. That's how infinitesimally small this class one carcinogen is. So, African orphan crops, a new way of thinking about breeding, everything I've talked about, you can't wake a person who's pretending to sleep. Thank you very much.